This is Solve It for Kids. Hello, my amazing and curious friends. My name is Jennifer, and this is Solve It for Kids, the podcast that gives kids and families a peek inside the real world of scientists, engineers, and experts as they solve problems in their jobs using creativity, cooperation, and critical thinking. And now please welcome to the show my podcast partner, Galactic Space Geek, Jeff Ganya. Hello, Jennifer. I am so happy to be here today. We have an awesome topic today. Oh, I can't wait. Can you tell me what it is? Let's find out. How do you find a hidden giraffe? How do you find hidden giraffes? How could they be hidden? They're so big. <laughs> Let's talk to David Brown, a biologist, wildlife conservationist, and environmental educator who has spent decades researching the giraffe population in Africa. Well, welcome to the show, David. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jennifer. It's great to be with you. We are so excited. So all about giraffes. So correct me if I'm wrong, but we are going to be discussing how do you find hidden giraffes? That is what we're going to talk about. And giraffes are closer to space than most animals are. So we at least have that for you, Jeff. <laughs> I love well, that. Hey, David, That's we're not all the way to space, excellent. but we're getting a lot closer than a lot of other animals. So, so we're halfway. That's we're, we're a little fraction of the way there. That's awesome. Okay, so you're a biologist. So how did you get started looking at giraffes and studying them? Well, that's a great question. Since I was a really little kid, even before I can remember, I started talking about giraffes, apparently. My parents tell me that I wouldn't stop talking about giraffes. And when I was about three years old in the early 1970s, we got on a train. I grew up in California, and mm -hmm. there was a World's Fair up in Washington okay. State. And so we took the train oh, and I wow. woke up in the morning and I saw the forests of the Pacific Northwest. And I said, are we in Africa? <laughs> I, I was so excited about possibly seeing giraffes. And I didn't get there then. It took several more years. But when I was in my 20s, I finally got to Africa and to see wild giraffes. And I knew all this time that I wanted to be a zoologist and I really wanted to study giraffes in the wild. So I went to college and I got a zoology degree. And then I went to graduate school. And that's when I was able to study giraffes. And right about the time that I started graduate school, people were using genetics to study how animals oh. move through their environment and how the populations of animals across continents and across their range where they live are organized. Sure. And so I had the idea to use genetics to study giraffes. So that's how I made it happen. And it took a long time, but it did happen. So if anybody <laughs> wants to study an animal, if you really, really want to do it, you can probably make it happen. That is very cool. So the first thing that leads me to is even though you didn't see them in the Pacific Northwest when you were a kid, are there any giraffes in America? There are giraffes in America. Aside from zoos. zoos. Yes, aside from zoos. No, there aren't. The only wild giraffes live in okay. Africa. That's the only place you can find wild giraffes. That had to be incredible seeing them on the savanna. That's the right word, right? That's seeing correct. the giraffes yeah, on the savanna. Exactly. What was that like to see them? I mean, did you get to see them like run in herds or, I you know, did. how does that work? I did see them run. It was amazing. So giraffes live in the grasslands and the grass woodlands of Africa below the Sahara Desert. Uh -huh. And historically, okay. they lived in West Africa and Central Africa and Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. And I first went to Kenya to see them. And the first morning that I saw them was at the Samburu National Reserve in northern Kenya, and I had an amazing experience. It's called giraffe magic. We saw giraffes from a Land Rover. They were probably about 100 yards away. And then we watched them for a little while, and then the Land Rover went up the road a little ways, and we looked back, and it looked like the giraffes had disappeared. It would have been impossible unless they had beamed up like in Star Trek. <laughs> But we knew that they hadn't beamed anywhere. So we thought, where did they go? And it turns out that they were standing right where they had been. The giraffe spots, if they're in the right amount of shadow, can make it look like the giraffe disappears. And some people have called that giraffe magic. And it's something that I had read about as a kid. 
and couldn't really imagine because it's not something you'll really see in a zoo. You'll only see it in the woodland habitat where the giraffe lives. And those spots, sure enough, broke up the light. So it looked like the giraffes had disappeared. It was really amazing. You know, imagine an animal as big as a giraffe disappearing from view. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's unbelievable to me. I mean, giraffes are so tall and they're big animals. And to have it just kind of disappear like that. That's crazy. It was of. amazing. It was amazing. But you can imagine that giraffes live in an area where a big giraffe, it's hard for a lion to take down, but for a baby giraffe, one of the sad things that yes. scientists have learned about giraffes is that most baby giraffes don't live to adulthood because they get eaten by leopards or they get eaten by lions. Oh. And so you can imagine that those spots over time, and we know giraffes have been around for at least a couple of million years from their fossils, that you know, over time, those spot patterns increase the chances of giraffes surviving. And so even though you have this massive animal, one of the largest land animals that's ever lived, it still has found a way to disappear under certain circumstances. It is amazing. So you said when you first saw them, you were about 100 yards away, and then you started driving away, looked back, and they had disappeared. Yes. How far away did you drive before you looked back and they had disappeared? You no, know, it wasn't long. It was maybe we had driven up 30 or 40 feet. Oh, oh wow. my gosh. It didn't take long for the giraffes to disappear. So so these are the hidden giraffes is what you're talking about. So well, how- you know what? That is a way that giraffes hide. But what I found with my genetics research was that there are different species of giraffes. So... Let me sort of tell you the story of how many species of giraffes we think there are. So different types of giraffes in different parts of Africa have different spot patterns. So the spot patterns in the giraffes that I saw in Kenya that I described using their giraffe magic were the reticulated giraffes. And those are giraffes with reddish spots that are kind of roundish, and they're connected by a white net of lines called a reticulation. And so this is actually a kind of giraffe that you can see in a zoo. And then in southern Kenya, there's another type of giraffe called the Maasai giraffe, which lives in southern Kenya and Tanzania. So on the plains of the Serengeti and throughout Tanzania. And the Maasai giraffe has spots that are really jagged. And some of them look like leaves. They kind of look like maple leaves. So the way that I remember it is that the Maasai giraffe is a giraffe that has spots that look like the things that it eats, the leaves. (laughs) And then there's there's a third kind of giraffe in Kenya called the Rothschild's giraffe that lives in Western Kenya historically. And it has spots that somewhat resemble the reticulated giraffes, but they're the color of pepperoni. Oh. (laughs) And they have white socks. They have white markings on their legs that go up to around where their knees are. And so those three types of giraffes all live next to each other historically. Their ranges have unfortunately been eliminated in a lot of parts of where they used to live because people have expanded where they live. But historically, those giraffes would not have been separated from each other, and they could have all intermixed with each other. And because they intermix with each other in in zoos, when you put them in an enclosure together and can have babies, people assume that there was just one kind of giraffe and that those three different types of giraffes, the Rothschild's giraffe, the reticulated giraffe, and the side giraffe, were all one species. But what the genetics showed... so. For my research, what I was able to do was collaborate with several people. And one of the things, if you go into science, you'll find is it's really important to work with other people, because especially (laughs) on something like a giraffe, where you're talking about animals that live over a wide area, and you really need a lot of teammates to help you do your science. And so I had teammates who helped collect genetic samples from across Kenya for the reticulated giraffes, the Maasai giraffes, and the Rothschild's giraffes. And when I took those genetic samples into the laboratory, we found that each of those three types of giraffes was very distinct from each other. And they were not interbreeding with each other like we thought they would because that's what they will do in a zoo. And so the definition of a species is a group of animals that breeds only with itself and not with other groups. Mm -hmm. And so we found in Kenya, three very distinct groups of giraffes that had been separated from each other for hundreds of thousands or millions of years, which was completely surprising because there's no barriers to them moving into each other's range that they couldn't overcome. There's no mountain range, no right. raging rivers, no forests that would prevent them from going and mixing with each other over hundreds of thousands of years. So when I say we found a hidden giraffe, there was a hidden speciation event going on within giraffes. And so that was the three giraffes within Kenya. 
And there's six other types of giraffes that were defined as what are called subspecies, which means that they're not fully separated from each other, but they're different enough from each other that you can tell that they're different. Okay. So with the genetics, we looked at several of the different giraffe subspecies, and we found that there are several different speciation events. There's several different giraffe species. That was a scientific paper that we published in 2007. And since then, some of my colleagues have published other genetics studies that have confirmed the patterns that we found with genetics. When I did my study, we didn't have giraffe populations from all across Africa. We had a population from West Africa, the three populations from Kenya and East Africa, and then two populations from Southern Africa. And that encompassed six of the known giraffe subspecies, six of the nine. Wow. And then subsequently, my colleagues have filled in the gaps and collect even more genetic samples. And now we have more genetic studies showing that there's probably about four distinct giraffe species in Africa. And 20 years ago, we didn't know that. People thought that there was just one species. Now we know there's at least four species. And that's really important from a conservation perspective, because if there's only one species and populations of giraffes go extinct in West Africa, which would be really sad, some people would say, well, that's okay. There's still plenty of giraffes in East Africa and Southern Africa. But what we've really know now is that's not true, is that the giraffes in West Africa are a very different kind of giraffe from the giraffes in East Africa and the giraffes okay. in Southern Africa. Gotcha. And within yeah. Kenya, not all the giraffes are the same. There's three very distinct species within Kenya. So if we really want to conserve giraffes, we need to conserve each type of giraffe. Exactly. That was one of the lessons from my research, you know, and that's when I say there was hidden giraffes, we discovered that there's some really important conservation information in there that we didn't know before we had done the study. And so you're always discovering things in science, you know, we didn't know ahead of time we were going to find this pattern. It was something that we discovered. We were very excited to discover it. You know, it's not just giraffes where people are making these discoveries. They're making these discoveries in all kinds of animals, even animals that are very well known that are very famous, and we assume that we know most things there are to know about them, like giraffes and elephants. You know, another lesson I take away from this is that even the things that you look at and love and think you know everything about, there's always new things to discover, and sometimes really significant things. And that's science, right? That is science. That's science. That's I mean, science. there's always that's stuff. Big, that's why we do all this, right? Yeah. That's it's... why we go to other planets. That's why we, you know. Dive to the deepest parts of the ocean. Dive to the deepest parts of the sea, become off Yeah. Well, it's really cool. I mean, I'm curious. So tell us, like, are these giraffes different in size too? Not you know, just they're all the spots? same size, pretty much. And So how tall? Pattern. Like, give me a. How tall? Me. Okay. So that's a good question. So. A really, really tall giraffe would be about 18 feet tall. That's a male giraffe. Male giraffes are a little bit taller than female giraffes. So maybe two or three feet taller. I think that's approximately right. And one of the reasons people think that there's that difference in height is that the giraffes will eat at different levels on the tree. So they're not competing for food. (laughs) That's interesting. Yeah. So that's going on. So that's one of the differences in height. But you know, a female wow. giraffe, maybe 14, 15, 16 feet tall. A male giraffe, 16, 17, 18 feet tall. That's about the range of the heights of an adult giraffe. And then when a baby giraffe is born, it's about as tall as I am. So I'm about six feet tall. A baby giraffe is six feet tall. Can you wow. imagine? That's and the first starts. thing that happens to a baby giraffe when it enters the world, because its mom gives birth standing up, is it drops about seven or eight feet oh, to the ground. I've, no, I've heard that. I've seen, they'll show on the zoos sometimes yeah. when the baby giraffes oh, yeah. are born. And you're kind of like, ouch. Usually they make sure that they're <laughs> in hay, right? Yeah. Straw places. So, but And in so, the wild, they're in the grassland. So there's a little bit of shock absorption there. But still, <laughs> imagine that's quite a way to enter the world. That's a way to wake up. <laughs> and how exactly. soon will a baby giraffe start walking on its own? Uh, almost immediately. A baby giraffe needs to start walking almost immediately because you can imagine it's in a world of predators. There's hyenas, leopards, and lions. And if you're just laying around, you're a snack for somebody. Exactly. (laughs) So you need to get going really fast. And so like Jennifer said, that wakes you up and gets you walking. So even though you hadn't seen, we're talking some really cool stuff about giraffes. You said you knew as a kid that you wanted to study giraffes, Mm -hmm. even though you hadn't seen them. How did that come about? I'm sure it was books. You know, I'm sure it was books. One of the things I really remember vividly is when I was a kid in the 70s, we had a toy called a Viewmaster. Oh, yes. This was was before the internet. Okay, so you have to imagine it's this plastic toy. Kids will have to Google it. 
you have a <laughs> yes you can google it with a little disc and the little disc has pictures when you put the little disc in the view master you get a 3d view of the picture and yeah. so i remember very vividly for my third i think it was my third or fourth birthday my grandmother gave me a view master disc of wild wow. animals of africa and so that's the first time i remember seeing what the animals look like in the wild not just in the zoos you know i'm sure i'd been to a zoo before that and probably yeah. seen them on TV, probably had a book read to me about them. But that was the first time I remember really seeing them and thinking, oh, I really want to see them in the wild. I really want to study them in the wild. Remembering that from that long ago to now, you have done research yeah. that takes you all the way into new species. It has been, I've been very lucky. I've been very fortunate to be able to do that. But I hope wow. that, I hope with that, you know, and there's a lot of times people have said, well, you know, that's not very practical. And that's true. And so you have to really want to do something like this. But I think that if you do really want to do something, even if it doesn't happen the way that you initially imagined it, because when I was a kid, it would have been unimaginable to use the genetics to study the drafts the way that I did, because the technology didn't exist. Right. The science didn't really exist. So I was fortunate that when I was ready to study the drafts, there was this new technology, really, for me to study the questions that I wanted to ask about how many kinds of drafts are there in the wild. And even in the time since I started my genetics research approximately 20 years ago, there's been an amazing development of technology. So now, you know, I was only looking at little pieces of the genetics of the giraffe. There was a scientific paper that just came out a week ago, as we're talking in May 2021, by a group of my colleagues, and they sequenced the whole genome of the giraffe. Wow. So they looked like the whole genetic map of the giraffe. They compared genomes to giraffes across Africa with each other. And that would have been science fiction when I was doing my genetics research only 15, 10 years ago. Jeez. Because yeah. the technology has increased so much. And when I was doing my research, we didn't have the computer, the supercomputers that could do the analysis. Because when you're sequencing the whole genome, you're talking about immense amounts of information yes. that you not only have to generate with a genetic sequencer, but you also have to process that information and analyze it. And so right. it's only within, like, say, the last five years that we have the techniques available to compare whole genomes between individuals in populations across a whole continent. So it's really amazing what's going on now. So I can't imagine what genetics research is going to be like in the next 10 years when your readers are ready to do their genetic research. It'll yeah. be amazing. I mean, the technology is just cool. So one of the things I'm assuming you use some of this information for is for conservation, right? And I know that you've created yes. a website that kids can get involved in, and learn about yes. conservation. You want to talk to us about that? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. So I am the co-editor along with my friend Megan Strauss, who is also a draft biologist, and she studied the ecology of drafts in the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. And Megan and I work with the team at mongabay.com. And mongabay.com is one of the world's largest nature and conservation science websites. And we have created a kids version of Mongabay called Mongabay Kids. It's at kids.mongabay.com. It's free, it's available 24 hours a day. And the purpose of this is to help young people get engaged with nature, learn about the wonders of biodiversity. We have a feature called Field Trip, where we interview scientists, conservationists, artists who are doing conservation, all kinds of conservationists about their work. And we go on a tour with them through an interview and a photo journey of their work to take readers on journeys to learn about chimpanzees, to learn about giraffes, to learn about just about anything. And there's an email there where people can email us if there's something that they want to learn about or if they are an investigator themselves and would like to have a field trip done about their work. We have a section called Nature on Parade, where we explore various aspects of biodiversity, paleodiversity, plants. So one of the really important things that we want to do is help raise awareness about plants and get people excited about plants, because really? there's a scientific phenomena that people have documented several different ways that people simply don't see the plants in their environment, even though we know plants are just as important <laughs> as animals. Animals could not survive without plants. We wouldn't have a breathable atmosphere without plants the way that we do. So we have a feature called Talking to Plants. Uh, it's a plant <laughs> talk show. So we have two host characters. We have Doug Beetle, who is a dung beetle. And we have Sophia Saba, who is a tree. And a Saba tree is a very important tree in South America. And we have a series of comics introducing Doug Beetle and Sophia Saba. Cool. And then Doug has his wild library where we have factual information about the animals. 
And Sophia Seba has a lab where we have art activities and science activities people can do to learn about I plants and it. animals. And giraffes are in a lot of conservation trouble. Their habitat in Africa is being converted to human use. And that is not surprising around the world as societies develop, you know, we use up our environment. But we can also find ways to live with animals and have a sustainable civilization. And so we want to help kids find a way to do that because science and conservation are team sports. We all have to work together. A lot of people love giraffes. You know, just like I discovered there were hidden giraffes. We've also, you know, people thought giraffes were doing okay in the wild as late as the 1990s. But now we know that there are a lot less giraffes in Africa left than there are elephants. And we know elephants are in a lot of trouble. So we need to protect giraffes in their habitat. The main people who are going to make those decisions ultimately are the young people living in Africa who live around the giraffes. But kids around the world can help support those people, you know, through moral support, through helping support conservation programs on the ground. And so Mangabe Kids exists as a way to try and get kids excited about biodiversity, learn about biodiversity they might not know about, provide role models and ways for them to think about how they might become conservationists, scientists artists who champion biodiversity. And so we're there and we would love kids input and parents input and teachers input. And we're hoping that we can develop this over time and maybe we can partner with you guys at some point, you know, that would be fabulous. Tell people about solve it because I think you're doing fantastic work too. And Jeff, maybe we can even talk about the life that we're going to discover in space in the years ahead. (laughs) We're going to learn about biodiversity on other planets as well. We've had some pretty awesome guests about conservation, including Philippe Cousteau, who's with Echo International. So yeah, we've had some to check out those. We like to ask all of our guests to give a challenge. Do you have a challenge for the kids? I do have a challenge. You know, we found out in the last few years that even though there are animals that are extremely popular, like giraffes and elephants and lions, and everybody knows what they are and people love them. We name sports teams after them. We make movies about them. We make nature documentaries about them. A lot of these animals are really in a lot of conservation trouble in the wild. And in order to help save them in the wild, a really important conservation action is that a lot of people pay attention to them. And get to know how they're doing in the wild, not just one time, you know, but check in with them from time to time. However often you feel like, you know, we follow sports teams, we follow our favorite celebrities, we follow our favorite TV shows. But we also need to follow our favorite animals and maybe our favorite plants. And so my challenge is for kids to create a poster about an animal or a plant that they really love that will help get their friends excited about the animals, their classmates their parents, their family. And the challenge is, you know, help get other people excited about the animals and plants that you love. That's a really important conservation action. It's the first step we need to take in long-term conservation of these plants and animals and make a poster celebrating them. I love it. That sounds terrific. And as soon as you said poster, because we've been talking about giraffes, my brain went right to a poster of a giraffe And I'm wondering if our first kid that is going to show us their poster on our social media, is the giraffe going to be sticking out past the size of the poster (laughs) because the giraffe was so tall? Well, that's part of the challenge, too. If you're studying a big animal, how do you fit it onto the poster? And if you're you're really excited about a small animal, then how do you make it a big deal? (laughs) I love it. I love it. I hope our listeners jump into this one because I really want to see the creativity on this. And I want to see what our listeners have as favorite animals out there. I I can't wait to see that myself. That will be so exciting. That would be awesome. Well, this has been a fabulous chat with you today, David. I've learned so much about giraffes who are, by the way, one of my favorite animals. So thank you so much for being here with us on Solve It for Kids. Well, thank you, Jennifer and Jeff, for the opportunity to talk with you. It's been fantastic. And thank you to your listeners for learning about giraffes. And I hope that they will become giraffe conservationists too. One of the things that I've learned in conservation and one of the things that motivates Mongo Bay Kids is You don't need a lot of money to be a conservationist. You don't need a fancy degree. What you really need to do is care about the plants and animals that you love. And then that will help you find ways to help conserve. And we know that our listeners care. So listeners, go to kids.mongabay.com. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate talking to you. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, David. 
Well, Jennifer, how fun was that? And I don't think David was telling us tall tales because he spent a couple of decades with the tallest animals in the world. Giraffes. Who doesn't love giraffes? And talk about a cool challenge. What do you think of that one? I mean, that's just awesome. Creating a poster of your favorite animal. I mean, I love giraffes, but my favorite animal is the koala bear. What's yours? The first one that pops into mind is a ladybug, actually. Oh! So just imagine how many ladybugs I could get onto a whole poster. A lot! All right, kids, it's your turn. We want you to go and create your poster of your favorite animal. Remember, you're supposed to make it so that you're trying to convince other people that this animal should be saved and it's the coolest animal out there. We would <laughs> love it if you would share it with us. So you can tag us on our social media, which is at KidSolve on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And yes. if you forget how to do that or what the challenge is, go to our website, SolveForKids.com, where you'll find tons of information, including information about Jeff's cool conservation site. Right, Jeff? That one's actually going to be David's cool conservation website, but that is kids.mongabay.com. And he has got so much information on there. You are going to have a whole lot of fun when you go to that website. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. So we are excited because we know we have another amazing episode next week of Solve, Solve It, it for, for Kids. kids.